Good morning, John. How are you doing? <laughs> hey, John. How are you, sir? Doing great. Doing great. I always say this at every at the beginning of every episode. It's just hard to believe how fast the year has gone by. Episode 18 is the 16th of December. The holidays are upon us. It's like time just flies. <laughs> it really it really does. And I can feel the chill in the air up here in the Northeast. And I'm in Connecticut and uh, I'm ready for the holidays. I got to get my tree up and all the other good things. Kids are coming home from school for this winter break. So a lot of oh, fun awesome. activities. But what do, what do we got that's... on the schedule today, John? What do we got going on? Well, actually, speaking of weather, it sounds like it's cold up there. I won't tell you that it's going to be, I think, 78 here in Dallas. Our guest today is uh, Meinl Khan, who is the CEO of Field Nation, and he's based up in Minneapolis. Let's bring you on, Meinl. Um, and I heard it's a, it's a warm 19 degrees up in the Twin Cities this morning, right? John, right now, I'm very jealous uh, that you're in Dallas. Uh, it's, it's freezing cold, and uh, it's been a crazy, it's, we're getting some crazy weather up here. Yeah, I heard about the winds and everything, too. See, the problem that I'll tell you about Dallas and Texas is, is when we don't have winter, and this year we probably won't, sounds like a weird thing to say, none of the bugs die. So we still have, don't laugh at this, we still have mosquitoes and the dogs get fleas and things. And, I mean, we never have that sort of culling, you know, when the when the winter comes along and it can't kill stuff off. So, uh, but no, we are super excited to have you on the show today. Good to be with you both. Uh, really excited to be here. So, so Mino, yeah. tell us a little bit about yeah, tell us a little bit about Field Nation and um, you know what is Field Nation and what specifically do you do in the marketplace? Like, what is this firm? What does your firm do? Yeah, John. So, so Field Nation, we're the largest field services marketplace. We are connecting businesses that technology services businesses, um, whether OEM, MSP, VARs, te telecom companies that are uh, deploying uh, large. Uh, you know, uh, technology infrastructure in the field uh, and they need technicians and engineers to get the job done. So, so we have over 100,000 uh, highly qualified technicians and engineers all over U.S. and Canada. Wow. And, uh, and our platform uh, has this marketplace that connects the businesses with the qualified technicians in the field. Um, and on top of the marketplace, we have a very robust workflow engine that allows our uh, customers and our service providers to come together, uh, engage, manage uh, the payment, the insurance, everything goes through the system. So it's an end-to-end -end work management system uh, that sits on top of a very robust marketplace. Wow. And it's all digital, right? It's all it's, digital. It's, uh, it's all on web cloud-based and, and uh, app as well. Oh, wow. So, and, so how did you how did you come up with this thirteen years ago? Where did, why did you see a gap in the marketplace that there weren't technicians? I mean, you know, how did you come up with this idea? It's incredible. So, look, it, it it's not uh, uh, the the story is not like, hey, I had a lot of experience and a big market inside. <laughs> Let's do it, uh, kind of thing. It was completely by accident. I saw, uh, I I met a company, you know, right out of college. Uh, and uh, they had this, you know, need uh, for uh, field service workers, and I built a, you know, a, a very basic system that uh, they can identify a local technician and blast out an email and so forth. And, and very quickly, we realized that this is not one company's problem; it's actually uh, the industry problem to find the right tech at the right place with the right skill set. Um, and and th that they can access to right and so that kind of was the genesis it was uh, you know it's by accident uh, but then very quickly we realized like oh my god this is a very big problem uh, in the industry and we can build something uh, really really valuable so you guys, you guys were actually disruptive before things ever became disruptive, right? 13 <laughs> years ago. I mean, that's really, really forward thinking to uh, have started this 13 years ago, right? <laughs> we were in the right place uh, and, and had the right problem in front of us. Yeah. So, so if I'm a Walmart or Target or a CVS or Walgreens, I've got thousands of locations all over America and I need to get something installed or something upgraded, um, you know, I do I contact you guys? Yeah, so that's really what we do well. You know, our mission statement literally says we are the best choice uh, for high volume uh, on-site technical technical work, right? So, and and just to give you an idea, 
uh, how how things at Field Nation. If you create a job that I need a point of sales machine installed, or I have an ATM down, I have a network down, I need some help, and you create a work order on our system with the scope, schedule, location. Guess how long it would take to get a uh, qualified response? Somebody who is available in that zip code or close by who is accepting the job and, and can go there uh, in a relatively, you know, maybe even a few hours and maybe at the same day. Guess how long would it take you to get a response, qualified response? Three hours. I don't know. <laughs> a week? Eight, eight minutes. Eight minutes. Eight oh, oh, no, you're saying you're, you're I, I was thinking you meant typical response. Y'all's is eight minutes. Oh, that's great. That's great. Eight minutes. Yeah, yeah, eight great. minutes. Eight minutes to get somebody who is available, qualified, interested, and happen to be in that location with the right skill set to, to, to do wow. the job. And so that's kind of what we do really well, right? And and then now multiply that with thousands of location. This year alone, we'll do 1.5 million work orders across the US. Wow. Um, and, wow. and it's all gonna happen mostly in the retail environment, commercial environment and so forth. So yeah, I think it's interesting. interesting. Oh, go ahead, Jamie. Yeah, go ahead. Well, I was gonna say what's interesting is though, how do I get qualified or certified? Like, how am I gonna know that um, the the technicians uh, are going to be qualified or certified to kind of do the work I do. How do you navigate all that, the training and stuff like that? How do you do all that? Exactly. That's a great question, John. So 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 that's the any any company that comes to us, that's the number one question. Like, okay, so you have a hundred thousand techs, but how do I know these guys can do anything that I need done? Right? Yeah, so it could be John and I. All, we could. You you end up sending John and I. We're not going to know what the heck to do. <laughs> hey, I know how to fix an ATM. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> but good news, guys. You know, the every transaction, you know, the work, the work order uh, goes through the system. That in every transaction, we collect, you know, hundreds of data points. You know, where the job is, what skill set needed, what tool set needed, how much was paid, what kind of, and, and most importantly, when the job is done, the technicians get rated. So when you open up a technician's profile with uh, on Field Nation platform, and you say, you know, uh, John uh, John Smith, you get to see how many jobs he completed, and from how many different clients, and what's the frequency of job for what kind of work that he is doing. Wow. Is he a network tech? Is he a point of sales tech? And what kind of ratings and feedback he is getting? So it's way better, although we are, we are live on LinkedIn, it's way better than LinkedIn profile where people can make up stuff. Uh, but when you see a, a Field Nation technician profile, this is all transactional data. Uh, and, and we capture all this data and then, and then present that back to our customers. So you know who are you getting. And they're getting oh, get it by thousands of companies, right? Yeah. No, and it doesn't get better than that, right? It's real-time data. So it's interesting, you know, this whole thing about field services is probably one of the Achilles heels of every enterprise out there, big or small, right? And I think one of the things is probably even more of an Achilles heel isn't just what I call field services in large metropolitan areas, but especially in the remote areas, right? If you're a large company, for example, if you're a Hilton Hotels and you have 6,000 hotels around the world, you know, it may not be hard to get someone quickly to a hotel property in New York City or Dallas. But what about that one that's, you know, that one hotel on that island in the middle of the Caribbean or something? Or, you know, how do you, you know, that to me, I think is a big challenge. So it sounds like this type of a arrangement really helps that because I'm assuming that you all have people everywhere within North America, right? That's exactly right. I mean, nobody struggles in, in New York City and Dallas and Atlanta, right? They know they, they, everybody, the, the, there's, you know, there's, uh, there's uh, services available very quickly. But the, but the but the platform like Field Nation, you know, when you have hundreds of thousands of techs, um, we give you coverage pretty much every zip code. Now, if the population is, you know, only 100 people uh, and you need a high end network techs, we still probably have to send a guy from a, a you know, a different city to go there. But, uh, you know, but but we have coverage pretty much, you know, every you know, you mentioned uh, Caribbean, you mentioned, you know, we, we have a tech in, in Virgin Islands, we have a tech in Alaska, we have, <laughs> we have tech in, uh, you know, Hawaii, we have, we have coverage pretty much everywhere. 
No, that's great. So hey, I'd be um, remiss I saw... if I didn't. I, I'd, uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask. Hang on one second, JP. Yeah. I'd be remiss if I didn't ask. You know, given what's happening in the world today with what people are calling this great resignation, um, you know, securing and retaining staff is just so key, right? Um, and I'm just wondering how that may be impacting the model and 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 the company and what you know your clients' expectations are in this sort of you know very crazy time, if you will. This is a really a, a hot topic right now, right? Uh, the labor shortage, and it's not just a labor shortage in, in certain industries, it's everywhere. It's no matter what yeah. uh, industry you look at, it's it's going on everywhere. It's in the news every day. But, you know, if you, if you, if you, if you really uh, think about it, this labor shortage was coming our way even before pandemic. And if anything, pandemic probably accelerated this process, mm -hmm. right? You know, some people decided to stay, you know, you know, when the pandemic hit, a lot of people got laid off and a lot of people are not coming back, uh, whether they're, you know, yeah. decided to retire, uh, not feeling safe during the COVID, whatever the case may be, a lot of workers is, are on the sideline and, and some people are not coming back. The, the, the thing is, um, you know, the demand in the market came back fairly quickly and it's it's probably one of the highest demand market uh that we are seeing um you know and uh, but there's just not enough workers uh to meet that demand and so what do you do um uh, and and so our a lot of our our customers and the you know companies in the industry who always dependent on uh full-time employees uh, to to get the, their job done, they're now saying, "Hey, I can't, I can't find people." Right. <laughs> the good news yeah. is that those workers who decided to retire, they're just not sitting on their couch and not doing anything. They decided to take a different path, which is, "Hey, I don't feel like to work eight to five anymore, but I'll take jobs if it comes close to my you know house, uh, close to where I live." And I'll work four hours. I will work two hours on Thursdays, four hours on, you know, Monday through Wednesday, whatever, you know, take Friday off. Yeah. And we are seeing that all the time, right? And we had this even before pandemic. If you look at the demographic mm -hmm. of Phil of Nation workers, um, independent contractors, uh, majority of them have, uh, you know, 10, 20, even 30 years of experience. They were full time at one point. They decided to leave that, and they decided to have an independent life or build a business on Phil Nation. And so we are seeing a tremendous um, demand coming from the technology services companies in our marketplace. Uh, our growth has been astonishing this year. I, I mean, we're a high growth company, but this year was just a, 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 a huge growth. Uh, and they're able. To, we're able to meet the customers' demand because we have such great coverage, and also the the retiring workforce, uh, you know, coming back on that on-demand workforce as well. Yeah, well, that's great. Sorry, our, baby, I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, no worries. One of our one of our listeners, John Gillian, uh, made a good point. He says, "Listen, the online talent platforms are going to be the future of employment, and it's really interesting. Like, um, I utilize Upwork a lot, and it's it's around the idea of getting." design work done and I can get work like our, our coffee mugs, you know, that was a, that was somebody out of, you know, uh, Czech Republic. Um, and it was back to me in 24 hours. So this idea of this online talent platform that John's talking about, that's exactly what you're in the middle of. And, and your specialty is this idea of technicians and really being able to really efficiently get out to thousands of locations within hours or a day or two, not an implementation of 50 people traveling all over the country to get 4,000 stores upgraded, right? That, that's exactly right. And, and, and the thing is, you know, the, 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 the example that you gave, that was a probably one-time transaction between you and that yeah. independent consultant. But in our case, the difference would be that our, our, our buyer side, our customers, our companies, the large technology services companies, and they need the work done all the time. 
the the quality is paramount for them the professionalism is paramount for them because the tech that shows up at uh, you know cvs or walgreens they're yeah. representing the brand right um and and so the 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 the, the one key difference for our, f- with our platform is that we help companies to build their flexible uh workforce uh, before before the the podcast started john we were talking about how we help companies to build their own gig squad. You yeah. know, we have 100,000 techs. Companies may not need 100,000 techs. Rarely any company need even 50,000 techs, right? But a company may need 500 techs. So our platform helps, uh, you know, kind of curate, vet, certify. And then you have this 500 go-to guys uh, that are not on your full-time uh, payroll. However, they're as qualified, as vetted, as committed to you, as loyal to you, as your full-time techs, and then you use them on demand basis. It's your cost is aligned with your revenue generation here. And and is there is there a concern about so so I assume that a lot of the work that that these folks do um, is what I call warranty work. You know, so things are under warranty. And so they have to be certified so that things remain in warranty, right? Is that ever an issue or how is that, or is that just a non-issue in this space? No, we do warranty work, but we do a lot of install work. We do a lot of break fix work uh, that have been probably under warranty and stuff like that, um, repair, maintenance, you know, stuff like that. Uh, but you know, we uh, our our system tracks certifications, um, mm-hmm. you know, all, all the other credentials, licenses, and and stuff like that, uh, and, and the customers can uh, you know. Uh, bring in a, a, a talent. Uh, if the talent does, doesn't have certification, they can sponsor that certification for the talent. Uh, but again, our network is so deep and wide. It, it, it's uh, it, typically you can find a talent uh, that you're looking for with the right skill certifications and license and, and stuff like that. And then once you find that right talent, guess what? You can put it in your talent pool and now that becomes your committed, your 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 go-to guy in that location. So here, so, here's another so, um, offshoot. Oh, oh, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead, John. Sorry, sorry. No, no, go ahead, John. So, so an offshoot question would be: so we're talking a little bit about warranty work, and it sounds like you do a lot of stuff at, in addition to warranty work, right? But if I think of somebody having a dedicated staff to do something versus using a an, a really really great service like the one that you have. Um, I think of like parts and things being available, right? So this would mean that the worker would actually have to have access to those parts in a timely manner to go out and do the work, right? Is that ever an issue or do they sort of have warehousing concepts or how, how does that work? Yeah, so so uh, we're seeing a lot of really different creative solutions uh, where a customer will ship the parts uh, on site or ah, uh, ah. tech will have access to a warehouse uh, close by, um, you know, um, a, a FedEx location or maybe a gray bar location and stuff like that. Um, but uh, but we're seeing a lot of creative creative solution around around that. But you're right, you know, when when it's a warranty work and you need parts, you need that access real quick. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, even I saw uh, some customers um, kind of, you know, sending parts ahead of um, any breakage. Uh, so oh, wow. the, the tech is sort of the the virtual warehouse, right? So he's carrying a few extra parts uh, when when the job comes up, they can they can go and fix it. Cool, cool. So, Sorry, Jimmy. so when you think about yeah, when you think about um, we we talked about you know uh, CVS, Walgreens, Target, all these re, you know we call them enterprise clients on at ISG, uh, but ISG also works with a lot of incredible service providers, Capgemini, LTI, Cognizant all these firms that are creating technologies that then may get implemented at enterprise. Um, do you work on that side of the house as well? And do those types of firms utilize your services also? Yeah. So I, I want to clarify majority of our uh, customer base is actually technology service providers. It's not the end uh-huh. customer, right? Okay. So, that's and, and that's I didn't that, know that. I didn't know yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the reason for that is it's the, 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 it's the problem of the, technology service providers to have the tech in the right place. Uh, a lot of time, yeah. as you guys know, that jo- the the enterprises don't don't worry about that. They outsource that to a service provider who, who, 
whose whose number one problem is to find the right tech and the right place and and so forth. So majority of our customer base is actually technology service providers or solution providers and and uh, and we'll work with them good okay that clarifies it that was what i was curious about um thinking about covid you mentioned the covid it's kind of been and, and john mentioned the great resignation so is this like the perfect storm for really accelerating kind of this um you know this platform of of technicians on demand so it's a really interesting question, John. If you uh, if you look at Fuel Nation history, we started in 2008, middle of Great Recession, yeah. and that was a catalyst. Every every crisis, I feel like it's a catalyst for both sides, whether you're a talent or whether you're a business, for both sides to <clears throat> kind of wake up from the st status quo and say, what else? How how else should I do things? You know, better, faster, cheaper. Um, and and it's always a catalyst. 2008 was a catalyst for us, uh, where um, a lot of people were laid off and said, "Hey, you know, I I I want to work, but I may not want to go back to full time anymore." And the company is like, "Okay, we're not comfortable to bring you know full time. You know, is there on demand service out there?" This uh, crisis that started into 2020 was also a big uh, catalyst adopting this on-demand workforce uh, especially we're seeing you know at a larger companies uh, are now uh, look you know we all experienced 2008 wasn't the year where people experienced airbnb and uber and on demand of everything right now yeah. fast forward 14 years later we all at a personal level experienced you know, on demand of everything from, you know, staying at someone else's house to take, you know, someone else's car and someone else <laughs> dropping off food at your doorstep. Uh, so, uh, so that experience uh, at a personal level, I think is making, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the decision makers at the large enterprises more comfortable, but also they're seeing that uh, mid-market is very comfortable adopting the uh, on-demand workforce. And they're saying, we need to, you know, during this crisis, this is the right time for us to look up and say, what else is out there? How else should we do things differently uh, to improve our service quality, you know, still keep the, uh, you know, the coverage uh, footprint that we need, uh, but we can't afford to have, uh, you know, the, the fixed cost model uh, anymore. Now, it sounds like flexibility is certainly key, right? <laughs> it is. It really is. So, so over the years, 13, almost 14 years, um, y'all have, mo you must've learned a ton of things, right? Um, and I was wondering if you can give us a little bit of a sneak peek about maybe what's sort of coming next in this space, if you could, um, without, without asking you to give away any secrets or anything, but what do you sort of see, you know, happening in the next couple of years, um, given where we are today? So, so one thing that's, you know, there is no secret about this, that the, the labor shortage is accelerating the technology adoption uh, for mm. every businesses, right? Whether it's uh, self-service uh, checkout at a retail store or even a robot flipping burgers because they cannot get, uh, yeah. you know, a, a worker to come, come in the, at the quick serve restaurant. So it's accelerating the technology adoption, and and that is a that is creating a great opportunity for technology service companies, right? Because now uh, there is more revenue opportunity to sell a technology or service a technology, etc. However, they are now challenged with their own labor shortage. Who is going to go and install them and and uh, maintain them and and so forth? And I think. Uh, you know, that creates an opportunity for them to look at uh, what else is out there. How can we do it in a creative way uh, with on-demand workforce and, and so forth? And that, that's why I think we are seeing a tremendous, uh, you know, momentum in our business, uh, uh, the, ca the catalyst of, of, of all the labor shortage and, cap you know, uh, COVID and, and so forth. Uh, so I, I think this is a, this is a, very interesting time. We're still in the middle of pandemic, 
the demand side of the market is, is just going up and up and up. The supply side is not able to catch up with this. And, yeah. um, and everybody is, is looking for technology as, as the rescue. And I, I think uh, it creates a lot of opportunity for everybody in the ecosystem. You all are in the one perfect the things, place at the perfect time. <laughs> Seriously, yeah, one you are. Of things that excites me, yeah, one of the things that excites me about this and what you're talking about kind of the future is we see a lot of work in IoT. And um, imagine, you know, this idea that your workforce is in tune with, you know, getting those signals around something that's like this is ready to be uh, main, maintained, et cetera. So all of a sudden that flow is all done through technology and a lot less people are involved in coordinating workflow, right? Because the, the computers are telling us that it's time to get something repaired or maintained, et cetera, right? Absolutely. I mean, we're seeing so much service automation where, uh, you know, a simple example, like you said, John, is that, hey, the IoT is sending a signal that uh, a machine needs, you know, maintenance, and then that creates a, a ticket and then our, you know, a system like Phil Nation could identify who is the closest guy, most qualified guy, and the guy may have already worked on a system like this before and automatically dispatch the person to go, uh, you know, fix it, right? Uh, so they, we are seeing tremendous service automation uh, across the board with not only with Phil Nation, but, you know, uh, in the broader ecosystem, um, you know, bringing in IoT, augmented reality, uh, all sorts yeah. of stuff. That's awesome. Um, all right, so look at Blockbuster created a, a mechanism for renting movies. Overnight, <laughs> Netflix figured out how to put them out of business, basically. And then almost overnight, on-demand movies like Hulu, et cetera, almost took Netflix out, but they adapted. So who's your Hulu in the marketplace what do you what do you stay up at night and maybe you don't want to share it but you know what keeps you up at night thinking about kind of making sure that doesn't happen right because because netflix did an incredible recovery and, and look at the stock but but it was close right so how do you think about that well look we are we are uh we are a start we are a 14 years old startup and we have the culture of startup and innovation and a little bit of paranoia all the time like you know are we are we keeping up uh, but look but at the end of the day we still view that we are at the very beginning stage of that uh uh of the curve that is you know the 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 adoption of on demand workforce it's not widely adopted yet uh but we are we are the catalyst we are the market leader and in it's our it's our job to uh, continue to innovate, continue to in introduce new technology, continue to continue to introduce best practices and stuff like that. We cannot just sit back and say, hey, we are a market leader, market leader of a, a market that's evolving really, really fast. So we have to evolve with the market as well. Oh, I love it. Oh, my, no. Wow. This is, this is a very, very interesting conversation. And, and like we said at the very beginning, we knew this was going to fly by. So we'd love to have you back next year. Thank you so much for taking your time to uh, to join our show today and very, very informative. And it sounds like um, you all have some even more exciting times ahead of you. So we wish you the best of luck and want to have you back on the show in a couple of months, if that's OK with you. Absolutely. Loved, loved being with you. Thank you so much for having me. Take Thank care. You, Michael. Bye -bye. Wow. <laughs> Talk about innovation, entrepreneurial spirit. And and he said it, too. Right. Being in the right place at the right time. He was there 14 years ago. And think about how to be best positioned for what's happening right this very minute. And, and I wasn't kidding, JB. If you talk to any enterprise, they always say yeah. that their biggest challenge is field services, especially for people that yeah. have a lot of remote stuff. Again, not in the larger cities, but you know, what do you do for the smaller cities and things like that, especially when there's service level agreements and expectations that things are going to be fixed within a certain amount of time, right? Yeah. Um, so well, no, because John, is, you know, if you opened up all your, if you opened up all your retail locations all at the exact same time, then it would be wonderful. Like everything works on that day, but as yeah. time goes, all of a sudden things need to be repaired and maintained, et cetera. And you need a firm like this that can get out there and repair stuff. So it, it's pretty intriguing. It'll be interesting to see how the market evolves and, and what other players might try to get into the space, but really good. So listen, we don't have a show for a while. What's going on here? 
Yeah, we know we're taking a little bit of a break for the holidays. Um, so our next show is not going to be till January 20th. And we're going to talk about healthcare equity. But boy, we have a lot of great uh, topics in store for 2022. Again, we've had 18 episodes in 2021. We can't thank our listeners enough for joining in and our guest speakers. We've talked about everything from retail to healthcare um, to, to on-demand um, on demand labor. Um, we've talked about data, which was one of the you know very, very interesting shows we had. Um, I think we've had a really great mix of different guests on the show. We'll continue to do that. We've had some wonderful CEOs join us. I mean, Meinl's incredible. And we're excited that he was here with us today. And just, I think the thought leadership and the entrepreneurial spirit is just wonderful. And we'll continue that through 2022. John, absolutely. It's, it's, um, COVID has been very tough for the globe, um, but a silver lining was this show was created. So it's been a pleasure working with you this year. And I'm excited about 2022. All the best, buddy. Same here. Happy holidays, everybody. Happy holidays, JB. Thank you. Happy holidays. Take care.